Hey, hey, welcome to Bigger Pockets YouTube channel. I am David Green, the host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast here today with my partner in the One Brokerage and fellow investor, Christian Bachelder. Christian, good morning to you. Good morning, morning. Happy to be here. Well, I'm glad to hear that. So let's talk about what loan products we are using in today's market to give buyers an advantage as well as strategies that we're implementing. Where would you like to start? Oh man, good question. I think everybody at this point in time has realized the strength of a particularly non-conventional loan products. I know that's something that we've spoken at length about, um, specifically referencing the you know boom of short-term rentals, um, the profitability that's needed from them to combat higher interest rates and make sure properties can still cash flow in this environment, um, and utilizing a loan product that is particularly favorable um, towards calculating projected income on short-term rentals. Um, most conventional products will require a 12 month history, so you can't use it on purchases. Um, but we do have loan products where just the rent projections for Airbnb can be utilized to help you qualify. All right, let's back up a second. When we say non-conventional, what are you referring to? Good question. Um, conventional loans are really what I mean is conforming loans, but conforming loans encompass conventional FHA, VA, all the, the words that you guys have probably heard. Um, and all that really means is that the guidelines are set by the government. That's just a way to kind of think about it. And lenders have to conform, mm -hmm. foreshadowing, yeah, that's why it's called non-conforming, um, but they have to conform to those guidelines set by whether it's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, um, you know, Ginnie Mae, there's, there's a couple of different agencies. Um, but anything that goes outside of that realm of that quote unquote conforming space um, is just called a non-conventional loan. Um, and that's things that, you know, get creative to calculate short-term rental income. That's things where you can calculate with bank statements instead of tax returns for self-employed individuals. Um, one of our products, you know, like we've talked about a lot, uses the rent income for the subject property instead of your uh, W-2 income or your 1099 income, um, which can be favorable to people who, you know, write off a lot on their taxes. So for a long time, those were the safe loans. You knew that you weren't gonna be taken advantage of if your loan was conforming. These were the 30 year fixed rate. You could trust it. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had a very good reputation. And it's not that they don't, but now there are safe loans that are not conforming. They're still 30 year fixed rate. They're still straightforward. You still can't get qualified unless either you make enough money to afford that property or the property makes enough money to pay for itself. And Christian, I, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what you're describing right now when you talk about non-conforming or non-conventional. 100%, and I think the lenders who are, are kind of spearheading these products are realizing Fannie Mae doesn't reward you for growth, right? They, they, they kind of punish you for growing your real estate portfolio, where in reality, if you're an intelligent investor and you're looking to invest into, into notes, into mortgages, would you rather lend to someone like a David Green, right, who has a portfolio of properties, who's shown competency and capabilities of growth, um, you know, or would you invest in that Fannie Mae range, right? And that's where a lot of these products have really started to become competitive, as David noted, 30-year fixes, competitive rates, because there's this big need, frankly, with the lack of, of growth that you're capable of under Fannie Mae and, and conforming guidelines um, into growing into this other space. There's two different ways that we qualify borrowers. One of them would be off the income that that person makes. The other would be off the income the property makes. Now, commercial properties for a long period of time, as long as I've been around, have used that method. They don't really look at your income, they look at the income the property's going to be producing and the bar or the lender feels safer with that method. Well, now we have the ability to do that in the commercial space as well. So can you talk a little bit about what different ways we can qualify people off income from different kinds of properties? I think the biggest thing that I just wanna note for, for 30 seconds here is also, some people kind of have, have commented that, oh no, 2008, people are getting loans without debt to income again. Yeah, so in 2008, the idea was you could qualify for anything because you could kind of say whatever you wanted to make and they wouldn't order your tax return transcripts, they wouldn't verify your pay stubs or you could Photoshop pay stubs. Whereas now the lender's doing their due diligence to make sure that your property cash flows. So the idea is if your mortgage is 2000 a month and you can rent it for $2,100, Obviously, CapEx and, and maintenance is a thing, but they're still projecting that you'll be able to make money or at least break even on that property while also requiring a larger down payment. You can't get DSCR, loan, DSCR loans for a 0% or 5% down, right? That's a huge difference from 2008 as well. So I just wanted to clarify that because people kind of have that doom and gloom sometimes. Same thing when, when they hear non-conventional. We're like, ooh, that means subprime. Uh-oh, scary. 2008. 2008. 
You're like, no, those were two-year adjustable rate mortgages with a negative amortization rate where your loan balance actually grew if you didn't make the full payment. This is not quite the same thing. Uh, when you say DSCR, that means debt service coverage ratio. And it's just a fancy way of saying we will lend to you based on the proportion of income the property makes versus what it's going to cost to own it. Makes a ton of sense, right? If I came to one of you and I said, hey, I want to borrow some money to buy a house, your first question might be, well, how much rent is the house going to make? And what is that in proportion to what the payment to me would be? 100%. Right. So I noticed a lot of investors are taking this route. Now, that could be because they no longer qualify by their debt to income because they have too many homes. It could be because they didn't claim taxes the last couple of years on income that they were making. So they're doing well in real estate investing, but it doesn't look good on paper and conventional notes are going to require you to show what's on your taxes. For people who don't qualify conventionally, for people who are um, you know, don't want to provide all the documentation for someone like your, yourself or myself, David, with our tax returns being nightmares and multiple businesses owned and 10, 20, 30 plus properties, you know, th those people are, are the bread and butter for this loan product. Um, they're just the, the time and energy that you're going to put into a conventional loan becomes not worth it at a certain point. Okay. Now, what about people that are self-employed? This is another sticky situation for loan officers. If someone can just say, hey, I have a job. I make this much money every month. Here's my W-2. Here's my pay stubs. Those are awesome. But a lot of the times that's not the case. So what do you recommend for people that are self-employed? If they don't. So number one, I would say what the property type is. If it's their primary, uh, we've gotten a lot of inquiries about this. You cannot use this debt service product for a primary residence. This is strictly for investment properties. Because a primary residence isn't gonna be making income. Exactly, that makes sense. You can't rent a primary. And now somebody may ask, what about house hacking? Lending, lending guidelines have not accepted house hacking quite yet. But um, the DSCR route would be my answer for self-employed individuals pursuing an investment property. But for primary and second homes, you can do bank statement financing. And it's basically a mirror image of conventional conforming guidelines. However, instead of going on your tax return income, which is after all your deductions, and as many of the self-employed listeners that are probably listening right now, you know, you, you write off liberally on your tax returns, right, to, to limit your tax debt. Um, but the idea is we can qualify you instead of what you report with your gross deposits into your business bank account or your personal bank account if you're 1099. So all that means is if you get... If you run a, an insurance agency and you're getting regular deposits every month, but you have payroll and you have insurance and you have your office rent, I don't care about any of those expenses. We're going to take your gross deposits. Let's say that's 10 grand a month. It's 120,000 a year. I'm going to take those gross deposits and a lot of lenders will have an operating expense, but that's what we qualify you on to calculate your debt to income instead of taxes. They don't look as good. Now, when people hear bank statement loan, they're often going to think, oh, no, that sounds like 2008. I remember those people would just make up their thing. What type of verification yeah. is going on on our end to make sure that people aren't fraudulently submitting income that they're not actually making? 100%. The biggest difference is uh, from 2008 is that there was no verification. You could say, and it wasn't even really bank statement financing at that point. It was just trust me, right? It was I'm photoshopping bank statements. We do typically do um, verification of deposits, VODs, which is actually lender verifying with your bank the amount that you sent on your pay, your bank statement is actually in there. So that is verified. They're verifying that your business does exist. You can't get this with a with a fake business. Um, they do ask for business licenses and you know area of operations and all that. Um, a lot of times they'll ask for invoices to prove that you are providing a business service. For instance, David, you're a realtor. Realtors are a little easier to confirm because you can go on Zillow and see past sales, but that's what they would ask and verify. Um, and then ultimately, you know, they're, 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 there's not really a whole lot more than that. They're, they're verifying the money that you have, the money that comes in. And, oh, I'm sorry. And the biggest one is um, they're using an operating expense ratio now. So in 2008, hey, 10 grand a month goes into your account. That's what we qualify you on. That's not really true if you have cost of operations. So they estimate, you know, whether that's 25, 35, 50 percent. They have estimates for different types of employment, uh, but they have operating expense ratios. And I believe we're using those on a couple deals I'm buying for myself, correct? Um, we have used a bank statement for you right now. The ones you're currently in contract with, we are not. Okay. But we have done that for you in the past. Now, I know one of the deals I'm doing is a burr. And so I bought this property, I got it under market value, which was awesome. And then I'm doing a pretty extensive rehab. It's gonna add square footage as well as update the property. And then I'm going to refinance at the end. Can you talk about the bridge loan that you found for me and how it was able to lower my ultimate down payment? Yeah, that, that product was really cool. Um, and I know we talked about this in a previous video, but to add a little more clarity to this, 
Um, David bought a property that um, it, it was it was under under market value. It appraised higher than what he bought it for. Our product is unique in that we can lend up to 90% of the purchase price as long as we're not overcoming 80% of the appraised value. So that's important. So if your appraisal is a is a million dollars, we can lend up to 800,000. But if you only bought it for 880,000, that's only 10% down, right? Because that 800,000 is your cap. Mm -hmm. So we can't lend more than 90%, but that, that is our cap if in the event you get an over appraisal. So that was a situation where David's situation was gonna require 25% down, and maybe if we got an exception 20, and because we got that property over appraised by, I forget the number, David, if you remember it off the top of your head, but it over appraised significantly. Yeah, I think I had it under contract at 2.2, and I think it appraised at 2.6 or 2.65, somewhere. Yeah, right. that's what I was going to say. It over appraised significantly, right? So that was a situation where instead of coming up with an extra, I think it was going to be $240,000 in down payment, that extra 10%, we saved that, and boom, there's your renovation expenses are all covered, right? Um, really cool product, but only available if the property is over appraising. Now, that's also not like a 30-year loan. So what are the terms on this product? Correct. Yeah, that is a, so a bridge product by definition is, it's called a bridge because it's supposed to be short-term financing just to bridge you to your final loan. Um, so it is not a 30-year fixed. It's not something that you're going to hold for more than 12 or 18 months at max. Um, it is an interest only um, product that is at a high interest rate. Right, but it's meant just to basically get you through your renovation phase. That that first couple R's in the bird process, right? Um, all right. Last thing before we get out of here, what are some problems that we've seen from other loan officers that have come our way, and we've been able to save deals for people that our listeners can learn from? Yeah, really good question. This is something I really want to stress, and this will be what we close up on. We've had a huge influx of people reaching out to us lately that haven't had their deals work with other loan officers. They've been in escrow. They've fallen out. Um, I think this is a, a result of increasing rates because other brokerages didn't have enough margin, whether it was in their pre-approvals or they didn't underwrite correctly enough. So what do you mean by that? In layperson terms? So what I mean is that if you guys if if you're a buyer and you were pre-approved for five hundred thousand, okay? Um, if that loan officer wasn't adding in a little bit of a buffer range there and you were absolutely capped out at five hundred thousand with the market interest rates at that time, and a month later the rates have increased you don't qualify anymore, right? So you're now either over your debt to income or you're over your cash to close, whatever the case may be, but he pre-approved you too close to what your absolute cap was. What we do is that we either do a lock and shop for conventional loans, which means you can lock it before you go into escrow. That's powerful. Or we pre-approve you, DSCR loans do not allow lock and shops, or we pre-approve you with a buffer zone, right? We just give you a little bit of wiggle room so that you're not, going over your qualifying potential the moment rates go up, right? So we've had a lot of fallout from that from other brokers. That's a great thing to know if you're working with the loan officer, they approve you at 500,000. If it was with us, you might actually be able to buy at 520. So if you if you get countered on something, if it's a little over your pre-approval amount, you should go to your loan officer and say, can I do this? Or on the flip side, if rates have gone up since you were approved, you might not be approved for 500 anymore. Now you might only be approved for 490 because rates going up affected your that's income ratio. So that's one problem. What about the, the issue of the low appraisal? Yeah, great question. If the lender's willing to put in the work for you, you can request what's called an ROV, and that stands for reconsideration of value. And what that means is that we can take those comparables that you ran on your initial analysis, and if we can make a argument that those are better comparables than what the appraiser used, we can actually get him to reconsider his valuation, which is basically just contesting an appraisal, right? Um, and the more a broker does it, the better they get at it. Um, we've done a lot of them, right? We've we've contested a number of appraisals, and that probably stems from you know my background and many of our loan officers' background, starting in real estate, right? The real estate side of the transaction before actually getting into lending. So we understand comparables. We understand you know how to run you know adjustments on that, and and we 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 have some success competing with appraisals. All right, that is fantastic. For people that want to get a hold of you that would like us to take a look at their loan, maybe they ran into a low appraisal and they need some help, how can people get a hold of you if they want to learn more? Yeah, our website, um, which we're just about to roll out a new version of it, theonebrokerage.com, um, or my email, christian at theonebrokerage.com, as well as the best way to reach me quickly um, and get in contact with the team to see what we can do for you. Christian, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. If you guys are listening to this and you learned something new, 
Let me know in the comments what you learned. If there's a question that you wanted us to go over, let us know that too. We will come back here and make sure that we answer those questions. Our producer, Kaylin, has been doing a great job of listening to your feedback and giving the people what they want. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. We realize that you could be getting this information from other places, but you prefer to work with the best and we love you for it. We will see you on the next one and please check out another Bigger Pockets video.